The wheel of time turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. This video contains no plot spoilers for the Wheel of Time, but does contain full spoilers for the Second Age and information about the world revealed in books 1 and 4. If you wish to know nothing, click away now and go read the books for yourself, but otherwise, this video should not impact your enjoyment of the story. In this video, I will be talking about various religions and cultures from our own world. This video is purely meant to be a fun examination of our own religions and cultures within the context of the Wheel of Time. I am not an expert in any religion or culture discussed here, and I encourage you to do your own research on anything talked about. I am at no point trying to insinuate that any of these religions are true or untrue, but wish to look at them anthropologically in order to give context to the other ages of the Wheel of Time. Hello everyone, my name is Kurt, and in today's video I will be explaining my theory about Jesus being the Dragon Reborn and how the First Age came to an end with a cataclysmic nuclear war. I will be theorizing about the events of the 6th, 7th, and 1st Ages by examining the myths, legends, and religions of our own world. At the beginning of the books, Earth is 3,000 years into the Third Age. Robert Jordan created a world where events, people, and places occur in an infinite cycle of death and rebirth. The Wheel of Time refers to the cosmic loom that weaves, spinning out a tapestry that makes up reality. Each life, each event, and each geographic location are threads in a pattern that repeats in seven cycles. Each time an age comes, the pattern spins out these threads allowing for people to be reincarnated. Each age repeats infinitely, and thus, at some point, the third age will come again, and at some point in the distant past, the third age existed. This is a concept that is ever-present in our own world. Robert Jordan freely admitted that he was inspired by many religions of Asian origin when doing his world-building. Robert Jordan said it plainly himself in an interview for Audio Renaissance in 1997. What about this notion of time as a wheel? Is that your idea? No, it's not mine. It is from uh, uh, Hindu mythology that time is a wheel. But actually, uh, most Eastern cultures believed that time was circular. Another example would be Buddhism, that teaches of the samsara or cycle of rebirth. During a person's life, they accumulate karma. Karma is the Sanskrit word for action, and thus karma refers to a metaphysical substance resulting from one's own actions. Your accumulated karma will impact the way you are reborn into the next life. Within the story, we discover that the Wheel of Time takes place in our own world. In the distant past, the First Age existed and left behind a handful of strange relics and legends. In Book 4, The Shadow Rising, while searching through a museum in Tanchico, Nynaeve finds A silvery thing in another cabinet, like a three-pointed star in a circle, was made of no substance she knew. It was softer than metal, scratched and gouged, yet even older than any of the ancient bones. This is a blink-and-you'll-miss-it moment, but what she finds is a plastic Mercedes logo, a relic from our world, the First Age. Tom Marilyn asks... Did Mosk and Merc really fight with spears of fire? And were they even giants? This tale from the First Age is actually representative of the Cold War. Mosk refers to the USSR and Moscow, and Merc refers to America or the United States. Over 6,000 years, the history of the Cold War has faded to a legend of two titans fighting with spears of fire. Metaphorically, the USSR and USA were both giants, and their nuclear weapons could be interpreted as spears of fire. By the time Tom brings it up, however, the legend has faded to a myth that no one can confirm or deny. Robert Jordan included a number of other references to the first stage, but I'll let you discover those for yourself. Lastly, this shows us that legends tend to come from the previous age, and myths tend to come from the age before the previous age. A legend is defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary as a story coming from the past, especially one popularly regarded as historical, although not verifiable. A myth is defined as a person or thing having only an imaginary or unverifiable existence. Essentially, a legend is a historical story with fictional elements, and a myth is more or less completely fictional, but can reveal something about the beliefs or cultures which it exists within. Besides these few details and Robert Jordan's own comments, we know very little about the start of the First Age and its following conclusion. Logically, the First Age must come after the Seventh, and the Seventh must come after the Sixth, 
But what exactly happened in those ages? We know absolutely nothing about the Seventh Age in the books. In fact, we know nothing about the Fifth and Sixth Ages and can only speculate on the events of the Fourth. Because of this, we must look to our own past to figure out how the Seventh Age came to an end. As I have indicated, Robert Jordan took a lot of inspiration from our own world when writing the story. Many elements of the Wheel of Time are borrowed from tales found within the Torah, Old Testament, New Testament, and the Quran. I'm sure there are more influences from other cultures, but these books are the ones I'm most versed in. For example, the Book of Revelation in the New Testament of the King James Bible talks about the end of the world where God will come down and raise the righteous into heaven. This book details the apocalypse where the world will be destroyed and the armies of hell will walk the earth. It's some pretty spooky stuff, with stories about angels and demons fighting in a cosmic battle where Jesus will return to redeem humanity. In the Second Age, these events more or less play out exactly. In The Shadow Rising, we see a flashback to the moment where the Aes Sedai broke into the Dark One's prison. What seemed a tiny chip of white spun away from the Sharom in a jet of black fire. It descended, deceptively slow, insignificant. Then a hundred gouts spurted everywhere around the huge white sphere. The Sharom broke apart like an egg and began to drift down, falling, an obsidian inferno. Darkness spread across the sky, swallowing the sun in unnatural light, as if the light of those flames was blackness. People were screaming, screaming everywhere. This is incredibly reminiscent of Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and, lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. From all of these details, we can see that each age is marked by massive change. The Dark One, for all intents and purposes, is the devil. One of the names used for him is Shaitan, which is an Arabic word meaning demon or devil, and this is where we get the name Satan from. The Dark One forges armies of Trollocs, Fades, and other hellish creatures, and wrecks havoc on the land. In the end, a powerful Aes Sedai named Luz Theron Telamon, known as the Dragon, saved the world by leading his 100 companions to Sheol Ghul. There, they sealed the hole in the Dark One's prison with an unbreakable substance known as Quendiar. In a final slight, however, the Dark One reached into the world and put an evil over the male half of the true source. From here on, any man who could touch Sayedin would be doomed to madness. In the years that followed the War of Power, the breaking of the world would occur where all male channelers succumbed to madness. With their minds gone, these men would destroy the world. Continents broke and were reshaped, seas were dried, and deserts were flooded as the Second Age came to an end in a reign of fire and brimstone. There is a chance that these events are actually the events depicted in Revelation. In the same Audio Renaissance interview, Robert Jordan had this to say. I wanted the, the circularity because I wanted, again, to go into the changes by distance. So the myths and legends and a few of the stories that these people tell, well, some of them are based on our own current events on the present. What they are doing is based on our myths and legends. So they are the source of our myths and legends, and we are the source of theirs. With this in mind, I think that as the ages of the Wheel of Time repeat, so do similar events across history. In the case of the Age of Legends, this was the War of Power and the subsequent breaking of the world. In the Bible, it will be the Apocalypse. In each age, too, it seems as though there is a champion of power who the world looks to for that change. In the Second Age, that was Luz Theron Telamon. In the Third Age, that is the Dragon Reborn. And in the First Age, that was Jesus. I believe within the context of the story, we can look to the myths of our own world as distorted images of the Sixth Age. If the Seventh Age makes up our legends, then the Sixth must make up our myths. In the Old Testament and the Torah, we read of many different mythical events, people living hundreds of years, towers stretching to heaven, and Noah and his ark. You probably know the story. Noah and his family are the only righteous people left in the world. 
God tasks them with building an ark to store two of every animal on the planet. God then floods the world, drowning the evil so that Noah and his family may start anew. The flood myth does not exist in a vacuum, however. It pops up all over the world. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, written somewhere between 2100 and 1200 BCE in ancient Mesopotamia, we hear the tale of Utnapishtim, the only immortal man on earth. He and his wife, being instructed by the god Ea, built a boat and were the only people to survive after Ea flooded the earth. The couple was granted immortality because of their preserved faith and to protect the future of humanity. This tale within the epic reflects both Adam and Eve as well as Noah's Ark. Another myth comes from the Inuit tribe, found in the northeastern region of North America and Greenland. Their flood myth details a great spirit being unhappy with humanity. The spirit floods the earth, leaving one man, or sometimes a spirit, Wayne Abushu, to float on a raft filled with animals. After floating for many days, Wayne Abushu decides to rebuild the world from a spot of mud found in the paw of a drowned muskrat. From this mud, Wayne Abushu places it upon the back of Mizuke, the turtle, and reshapes the world. Each one of these stories deserves its own video and breakdown, but clearly, somewhere in the Earth's past, there was some cataclysmic event that was felt by all of humanity. Obviously, the flood myth did not happen exactly the way it was described, as we have shown, facts fade to legend and then myth. But I believe that the Sixth Age ended with a flood of the One Power so strong it burnt out every channeler on the planet. When looking at legends and myth, we want to look for areas where metaphor could be mistaken for fact. I believe that the Flood was a metaphor for this massive rush of One Power. The Sixth Age, the channelers of the world became hedonistic. They wished to indulge in every pleasure, and in the end, it killed them. The One Power, like God, flooded the evil and washed them clean from the earth, and in doing so, more or less removed the ability to channel from the world. The humans that were left were not kings or queens, emperors or czars, but the small folk who suffered at the hands of those above them. The Seventh Age dawned on a humanity reset and reborn. Over the next four to five thousand years, humanity would be yet again reduced to nomadic tribes. Slowly, over time, humanity would flourish and spread across the globe once again. We would see the rise of great and terrible kingdoms. The Roman Empire, known for its achievements in medicine and technology, would also wreak havoc across the entirety of Europe. Across the sea, the Mayans, Aztecs, and Incas would build megalopolises that would rival in beauty anything seen in the rest of the world, and magic would slowly work its way back into humanity. For thousands of years, it would be a weak trickle. Certain people would be praised as healers, others for their incredible strength and some even their ability to levitate. The first Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, was said to be able to walk on water and levitate fully with his legs crossed in around 500 BCE. Hindu mystics and gurus are said to acquire siddhas, or powers through meditation. One of these siddhas is prakamaya, the ability to be anywhere on the earth at will, or more plainly, teleportation. The world would be far from perfect, however, Disease would run rampant, people would die in vast droves for petty squabbles over land, and the strong would oppose the weak. In the end, the Sixth Age would come to an end not with a cataclysm, but the slow death of a man upon a cross. We know that, in the Wheel of Time, the dragon has been reborn time and time again. This entity is known as the dragon in the Second and Third Ages, but it is understood that there have been many different incarnations of the dragon across the ages. This was confirmed in a 1998 interview of Robert Jordan with user Pam Basham. Basham asks, Is this soul born in any other age, or only at the advent and, theoretically of course, the closing of the Third Age, as the dragon slash the dragon reborn? Robert Jordan replies, This soul is one of the heroes, and bound to the wheel, spun out as the pattern wills. It is born in other ages, but in a non-dragon incarnation, to suit that preferred age. This interview spells out that the dragon can be born and is born in other ages. This also proves that each thread can be woven into many different people, but each has the same soul. In the prologue of The Eye of the World, Ishamael tells Luz Theron that he is one again, indicating that Ishamael has knowledge of past lives and all the times he has defeated the dragon. From this, it is easy to see that Jesus fits the dragon archetype. Jesus was prophesied in the Old Testament and the Torah speaks of a messiah. Isaiah 7.14 says, 
Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Just like the dragon reborn, Jesus' coming was prophesied. In the books, an excerpt from the Koreathon cycle reads, On the slopes of Dragon Mount shall he be born, born of a maiden wedded to no man. He will be of the ancient blood and raised by the old blood. When the winds of Tom and Gaiden scour the earth, he will face the shadow and bring forth light against the world. For he shall come like the dawn breaking and shatter the world with his coming and make it anew. With the coming of Jesus, so came the strongest channeler seen in thousands of years. Jesus would go on to use his power to heal the sick, turn water into wine, and even raise the dead. In the books it is said that someone who has died cannot be brought back by the one power. If we confirm to the rules of the Wheel of Time, this would mean that Jesus would not be able to bring Lazarus back from the dead. However, in the 2,000 years since his death, all of the stories surrounding Jesus have to be taken with a grain of salt. Again, Jesus is a legendary figure by this context. Lazarus may have been on the brink of death, and Jesus used the one power to bring him back to health. Jesus made one of the biggest impacts on our own world, shaping the course of human history for the last 2,000 years. In our own world, we mark time at the birth of Jesus. Currently, I am making this video around 2,030 years after his birth. BC stands for all the years before Christ, which count backwards until we reach his birth. AD stands for Anno Domini, which is the Latin for the year of our Lord. Modern historians have removed the religious elements of these designations by renaming them BCE, or Before Common Era, and CE, or Common Era. However, they match the time frame. In addition, religious wars have been fought for centuries, and many of the world's governments are formed on the basis of some Christian sect. Russia would not exist without the existence of Eastern Orthodox Christianity, as it was used to unite the warring factions of the Rus Vikings living in Eastern Europe in the 9th century CE. This lines up again with what we see in the Third Age. In the same vein, people claiming to be the Dragon Reborn have wrecked havoc across the world. These messianic figures are ultimately forces of change that attempt to do good, but in reality act like forces of nature which are neither good nor evil. Now, before we move on to the second part of my theory, let us summarize the first part. Jesus must be the dragon reborn because 1. We have confirmation that our world is the past and future of the Third and Second Ages. 2. Robert Jordan confirmed that the dragon can be reborn in other ages under different names. 3. Jesus, like Luce Theron, acts as a focal point for change in the world. 4. Many of the legends about Jesus mimic those we see in the Second and Third Ages. 5. Both Jesus and Luce Theron have prophecies surrounding their return. 6. Having all channelers be burnt out in a giant flood of the One Power in the Sixth Age explains the lack of magic in our own world today. And lastly, 7. Jesus being a channeler explains his miracles detailed in the Bible. Now that I have provided my argument for Jesus as the Dragon Reborn, I believe that the First Age ended in full-scale nuclear war. The only evidence I have for this is the old Mosk and Merck story. In our own world, the Cold War came to an end without nuclear war. But, if we take into account when Robert Jordan was writing the books, nuclear war was still a possibility. The Cold War more or less came to an end on December 26, 1991, when the USSR dissolved. The Eye of the World was published on January 15, 1990, a full year beforehand. In addition, The Great Hunt was published later that year on November 15. The Dragon Reborn was published on October 15th of 1991, and The Shadow Rising was published on September 15th of 1992. With this in mind, Robert Jordan had to have been writing the first few books many years prior to their published dates. Therefore, although The Wheel of Time is supposed to take place in our own world, we really can only count for the time before or shortly after the first book was written. If we consider the ending of the Second Age as well as Revelation, it makes sense that the First Age would come to an end with a massive cataclysm. In addition, we need to explain how magic was reintroduced into the world. I believe that in the world of the Wheel of Time, the tensions between the United States and the USSR remained high. At some point, the tension broke and the world was destroyed by fire. In regard to magic and channeling, Jesus may have paved the way in the world for strong channelers, but I think the creation of the atomic weapon could relate to this ability to channel. 
After a nuclear war, the Earth would be plunged into a long winter. Ash would cloud the sky, causing temperatures to drop and humanity to yet again be reduced to the Stone Age. However, with radiation sickness, only the strongest would survive, and I believe those people to be great channelers. Natural selection is the process by which environmental factors force change upon life. The strongest and most durable life survives and begins to change to be better suited to the environment. Slowly, over time, those people who could channel and heal the sick would grow more powerful as groups of channelers banded together. Finally, the population would be pushed to produce people with an immense skill for the power. In the Third Age, it is said many times that the power has been slowly bred out of humanity as all the men with the ability are gentled. I think that at the start of the Second Age, the opposite happened. Channelers bounded together, and eventually, humanity would produce individuals strong enough to reshape the globe. Lastly, the Second Age reached technological advancements much higher than anything in our own society or the societies found within the Third Age. At the dawn of the Second Age, over a thousand years, as the ash settled and the Earth returned to its normal temperatures, this technology would be left to be studied and reused. With a newfound strength in the One Power, humanity would be able to reach heights never seen. In the end, the only conclusion I can draw from this is that the First Age, like the Second, ended in fire. This video contains an immense amount of speculation and extrapolation. The Wheel of Time really does not contain much information about the First Age, but when writing the video, I had a lot of fun theorizing about its events. I was inspired to write this video on a trip in Scotland where I had the opportunity to visit a number of castle and monument ruins. In the end, I hope that, even if you think this is total BS, you enjoyed and learned something about myths and legends in our own world. Thank you so much for watching, please subscribe for more videos like these, and I will see you in the next one.